Okay, so tonight we have a very interesting and unique topic, which is this custom that's uh, rather universal. I believe it's universal. We'll, we'll discuss that perhaps soon. Which is to remove some wine from the cup at the Seder while we're reading from the 10 plagues. As we list the 10 plagues, we remove some wine from the cup as we list each of the plagues. And it's an interesting custom which have various different practices. We're going to focus on two practices specifically, two versions of how to do it, and then the various different variations within those two versions. And if we have some time, perhaps I'll share some of the other different uh, nuances that I found in different places. Um, but to get to the Rebbe's, what the Rebbe teaches, and the Chabad custom, we're going to focus on two, two main practices. So before we get to that, first let's just understand where we are in the Haggadah. Like, why is the Haggadah doing this, and where are we holding, and what's going on? So you remember from last week we read this Mishnah, which you see right there on page one. This Mishnah which describes the night of the Seder. The last tractate, I mentioned this last week, the last tractate of Prochim, which you learned, Arvei Psachim, the night of, the, the night of Pesach, the 10th chapter of the tractate, which discusses the laws of the Seder and the night of the Seder in general, in great detail. And there the Mishnah reads, and we read this last week, I'm reading the Hebrew, but you can look at the English in the first text there. Olufi daitel shalbein, in accordance with the knowledge of the son, of a Malambe, the father answers the question. Right? The, the Mishnah, just before this, t- this quote, lists the Manashtana and says the child should ask the Manashtana. And then it goes on, of Malambe, in accordance to the intelligence of the son, that's how the father answers the question. Then the Mishnah continues, Maschal Begnus, Messiah Bishvach, the narrative of the answer to the student, the, the, the son, is questioning should begin in a place of shame and then conclude in glory. That we discussed in great detail last week. The two different versions of shame and glory, either slavery to freedom, shame, slavery, glory, freedom. Gamora mentioned this, he learned this. And the other version, which is the shame is idol worship and the glory is now we serve Hashem. Right? And then Haggadah does both of those versions. And right after that second version, the Haggadah goes into Baruch Shemir after Chastai, blesses the one who keeps his promise. And then it reads the Vihisha Amda, which that's the promise. And then afterwards it goes to a section called Say Ulamad. Go out and learn Arami of Adivri and so on. And that whole section, all the way through the description of the ten plagues, is in fulfillment of the next words of the Mishnah, which read the Dirish, and the person by saying Nagada should expound on the verse which reads, Ma'arami Ovid Avi. The verses which say, My father was servant to an Aramite. What's this verse is referring to? This is the verses, we mentioned this last week. This is the verses in which the mitzvah is when a person has bikurim, he has his basket with his new fruit, he's to go to the base of Mikdash. And when he carries the basket in the base of Mikdash, he would read a whole script. And in the script, he would describe the Exodus. So says the Mishnah, read that script at your Seder and expound on it, explain it. So what do we do? So let's first of all, let's look at the Gemara. So let's look at the next text over here. Take a copy, or take a talk copy. So you can see that I quoted the Pesukim. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see that the Pesukim I quoted there from Tvarim Chaf Vav and Hey. You should have it there, and I'll tell you why you should have it. Because if you want to understand Haggadah as you're reading it, you should know what the, what's a Pesuk and what's not a Pesuk. Because what the Haggadah does then is it quotes the the verses of this of this whole text. When you arrive at the at the temple, you're holding. Uh, the basket with a new fruit, and, have, and the Pasuk says, you, you can read it in the second verse there, you shall take from uh, some of every fruit from the soil, uh, of, of the soil, which your harvest from the land that your God has given you, put it into a basket and go to the place where your God will choose to establish the divine name, meaning the temple that will eventually be established. You shall go to the priest uh, in charge, and at that time, and say to him, quote, I acknowledge this day before you, uh, before your God, that I have entered the land that Hashem swore to our fathers to assign us, the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of your God. You, see note, I'm not sure what that is. I, mean, I, quote, I, I, I copy paste it from Safari, so I'm not sure what that is. It says, you shall now recite as follows before your God. And this is what you recite when you're holding that, ba- when you put that basket down in front, of the, in front of the temple. What should you read? And that's why I put those three hours there. Because those three hours, arrows there is where the Haggadah begins to quote. Arami, Ovid, Avi, my father was a fugitive, an, 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 an Aramean fugitive. 
right? And then he goes on to say, he went down to Egypt and he was there and he multiplied. And the verse goes on to describe in detail the entirety of the Exodus until finally it says that God brought me to this land and now that I'm here, I have fruit and now I'm thanking you for them. That's the text. So what the Haggadah does is, the Haggadah takes these texts and breaks, takes every single word and explains it. Explains it. So when the verse says, um, in this text, as you're reading, when you bring the Pekodim, it says, and God took me out the strong hand. A strong hand, that's two plagues. And then when it says with an arch, outstretched arm, that's another two plagues. And when it says with great might, each item that you say in this narrative, Haggadah explains. Where does Haggadah get these explanations from? So let's look at the page. Is everybody with me so far? No, what page? We're on top page three. Let's so look at top page three. This is the first comment from the Rebbe on the word Seol which begin this whole process. Seol says the Rebbe, Al pi mashakosib Mishnah, based on that which the Mishnah says, the Dorish marami oivid avi, you should expound on the verse which says, my father was an, Ar- uh, an Aramean fugitive, right? The, the, the Mishnah says, you should take the verses that the Torah tells you to say when you bring Bikurim and you should expound upon them at your Seder, right? So now the Haggadah does that. Where does it do it from? So says the Rebbe, the Haggadah now goes on to expound upon it as per the instruction of the Mishnah, right? As the Sifri does. The Sifri is a Mishnahic era uh, Medrash. It's a Lachic Medrash, kind of. And there, the Midrash goes on to expound on these verses that you read when you bring the Bikurim in the Temple. So the Haggadah, in fulfilling the Mishnah's requirement to read these verses and expound upon it, basically copy-pastes the entire Sifri with some minor changes in there, but points out the various different changes. Following this is the flow of the Haggadah. We ask the question, we answer it in the two versions of begin with shame and end with praise, as we discussed last week, and then we do the next instruction of the Mishnah, which is to quote this text that you would have read when you brought your Bikurim to the temple and expound upon it. And we expound upon it by quoting the Midrash, which expounds upon those verses. Following? And that's what it constantly does. It says... That's the Sifri. That's the Sifri. So the Haggadah keeps on going. Bizarayin Atuya means X, Y, Z. And this words means X, Y, Z. This means, and so on and so forth. Going through the entirety of the text that you would have said if you were, when you brought your Bikurim to the temple. Clear? Yeah? Is that clear? So at the end of the Sifri comes the Mishnah discussing, the Sifri discussing the plagues because the outstretched arm and the mighty hand are all allusions to the plague because we don't mention the plagues in our speech when we say to God, thank you for the fruit that you've given me now that I'm freed from the land of Egypt. What you do say is that you, God, took us out with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand and with great might. So the Sifri says, oh, the outstretched arm that refers to these plagues and the mighty hand res- refers to these plagues. And the, right, so when it gets to that point, the God then lists the plagues. And at that point, we have the custom to take out, remove wine. So we just give you context now about how this all arrives here. Oh. Following? That's really this, is how, this is how we are at this point. It's the Mishnah. The Mishnah doesn't say anything to... Requiring us to expound on... That's right. The Mishnah is requiring you to expound. It comes from the Sifri. That's right. That's right. That's correct. So the, that's right. The Mishnah tells us to expound on these verses. So we go to the Sifri, which does expound in the verses, and we read the Sifri, which is expounding those verses. There's, a, there's some various changes between the Haggadah and the Sifri itself as we have it. And there were comments, as the, go, as the Haggadah goes on, there were comments on some of the discrepancies between the way the text appears in the Haggadah and the way it appears in the Sifri as we know it. But I'll just give you context as to where we are and why we're listing the 10 plays and what we're doing. And then the next part of the Haggadah, which is a very Lili, is already a further, expan- uh, uh, further expounding on the story beyond the requirement to be Dorish by Rabbi Ovid every beyond the requirement to expound on the verses that we would read when we go to the temple with Arbi Kodim. So this is when we go. Sorry? Who is the ball of God? Good question. Last year I gave a whole class on that. And, oh, yeah, on who where how that got to came about. And I and I mentioned this last time. Very, very recommended to watch that class because if, if you understand that class, you'll understand how that God operates and why it is the way it is. In the bottom line is the conglomerate. It's not one person writing anything. Over a few centuries. A few centuries. Probably from before the Mishnah till after, till of Amun Gain. You're talking about a few hundred years. Anyway, have a look there, you'll see. So they, in requirement, look at the class, but in requirement of the Mishnah's instructions, in the requirement of the Pusik's instructions, each community or each sage would say, okay, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this, we'll do that, until finally it came back on as we know it. Kind of. Anyway, you'll look there, you'll see. Okay. 
So this is where we are in Haggadah. We're at the end of the Safri expounding on these verses as Brother Mishnah's requirement. And at that point, we lift the ten plagues, and then we have this custom. Do we see the Safri in the Haggadah? It's just, it's almost directly copy-paste, but except for a few changes. It, it wouldn't say Safri, but the Rebbe tells us, who Darisha Atta Kadis be Safri. The Haggadah is now expounding upon it as it is written in the Safri. So from Arami, from the verse, some, from the passage, Seyo Lamad, all the way to the end of Rabbi Huda would give an acronym to the ten plagues, Datsach, Badash Bachav, till that point is all quote from the Safri. And then goes Rabbi Yisak Lili, which is another discussion about how many plagues were at the, about the sea versus how many plagues were in the, since we just concluded discussing the plagues, we're going to discuss more texts about the plague. But that, that, that's the Safri. There, again, there are a number of places in which the Haggadah has it quoted different than we have it in the Safri, and the Rebbe points this out as we go along. Okay, so now this is where we are in the Haggadah, and we're dipping, we're, we're removing some wine from the cup as we list 10 plagues. So where does this come, custom come from, and how should it be done? Yeah? Is, um, is the content of the Haggadah more or less standard? Almost, yeah. Almost, yeah. Okay, we discussed that also in that last class. I, I read, very rec- much recommend listening to that class if you haven't yet. Okay, so now we're going to discuss two general customs with regard to removing some wine uh, from the cup. And the surface, the two customs seem to be based on the same reason, but just a different way of doing it. But as we'll delve into the Rebbe's commentary, we'll see that not, that's not the case. And the second custom, which is the Chabad custom, to pour out is for a whole different reason. It's a whole different way of understanding the pouring of the wine, and it gives it a very different, uh, deep understanding. So cust- the two customs are, Generally speaking, either use the finger to remove the wine or pour it out directly. So if you look at the text here, the middle page three, you see I laid it out. So custom one, use the finger to remove the wine. Now when it comes to that custom, you have two questions and variables. Which finger do you use? The index finger or the pinky finger? Two customs. Number two is, once you're done dip, removing the wine, do you empty, what do you do with the rest of the wine that's in your cup? Can you just refill, as is the Chabad custom? Or do you actually have to empty out your cup and then wash it out and then fill it up again? About where you're putting the wine. Why is okay, so that, that is discussed. In, in the first custom, it almost says they don't care where you put it. In the second custom, we're going to see that's Dafka to put it into a broken glass, as we'll see. That's our custom, yes. So in this custom, you're taking and throwing it out wherever, and then either index finger or pinky finger, and then uh, there's some, we'll say you have to empty out the cup before you refill it. Yeah. Now, as I put down here, there's two reasons here. Reason number one is to remove Hashem's wrath from us and give it to our enemies, which is something which, which I discovered. Because the common, the common explanation is we were empathizing with the Egyptians, so you pour out some wine. Yeah? And I did see that quoted. I saw, in a, uh, there's for sure more places, but I saw one place, the Mesha Chachma writes this. That the reason is to sympathize with the Egyptians. But actually, the original reason, as we'll see, is because we're discussing God's wrath, these plagues, and we're taking the finger, and the, the, the language is, throw it away because you want to take Hashem's wrath and throw it away from us to our enemies. <laughs> so it's, it's actually not that sympathetic. It's the contrary. It's get rid of all of Hashem's wrath and pour it on the enemies. Yeah, that's the, that's the symbolism. Number one. Number two, as I write here, reminder of the finger of God. And the two customs, index finger or pinky finger, is a question of when the verse says, this was a God's finger, which finger of God does it metaphorically mean? God's metaphorical index finger or God's metaphorical pinky finger. And that's where the two customs come from to use the index finger or the pinky finger. Does it really matter? It's metaphorical, but every metaphor has to be precise, right? So whatever their spiritual version of index finger is, is different than the spiritual version of pinky finger. So <laughs> you, you would have to go with, with what the exact metaphor is. And those are the two customs. So this is an overview of custom one. Now let's get into it. So what, what Our custom to pour? We're going to see soon. We're going to see soon. Okay, so custom one to, pour, to, to use the finger is the more common one, I think, at least amongst classic Ashkenazim. To use the index. To use the, index is probably the most common, but to use the finger, whichever one. The, 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 the index finger is the most common one, because that's what the Ramah writes in the Shulchan Aruch. We'll see. That's, what the, that's what's written. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. But the most common is probably the, the, the index finger. Now, um, but the Chabad custom and other Hasidic circles is to pour out, not to use index finger, as we'll see, for Kabbalistic reasons, and we'll get into that. Sorry, they pour the Spartan pour out. Pour out yeah. Your grandmother pours them too. Really? So uh, that's, that's, that's good to know because I've, I've, uh, the Sephardic sources I found here that I cite here, I, I, I say to use the finger. Huh. 
So that's interesting. But I, I, I think I know why. We'll, we'll get to that. Let's get to they that. Pour, the Sephardic poured out in, in, in my wife's family with a little bit of water in each one. What do you mean with a little bit of water in each one? Like you, pour, you pour the wine and you pour a little water at the same time. Uh, uh, well, that's what interesting. Pour. One second. And you use the cup that you're drinking from and you bring a new fresh glass of wine to pour. So I did see no, some. It's a fresh glass of wine to pour. Oh, I did see that somewhere. Fresh. Okay, so we'll get into why that is also. There's some that bring a fresh glass of wine to pour. So that, 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 that makes sense. If you're doing the, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's see. So this is the earliest source that it seems for this custom. It's from this Yid, who's known as the Marash, not the Marash of Chabad, but the Marash of Neustadt. In English there, it's a place in Austria. Neustadt, anyone know what that is? I don't know. I'm giving a little background as to who this, this person, Rabbi Shalom, Be, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Shalom of Neustadt, we'll call him the Marash. So where this, who this Marash is, I give a little bit of a history background. And this comes from a modern version of his there's a book of his customs and practices, this Maharash. And in the introduction to this book, the editors give a little brief biography on who he is. And I'm selecting the parts of the biography that I think are relevant to understanding what's happening. Is so, this, does it stand for the same thing? Sorry? Acronym? Actually, uh, the Maharash of Chabad is Shmuel, and this is Shalom. Anyway. Okay. So the, the, the editors of this work of the customs of the Maharaj reads as follows, writes as follows. Our rabbi, meaning the Maharaj, was of this group of unique, special individuals, quote, Hasidic Ashkenaz, that the people called Hasidic Ashkenaz. Not the Hasidim that we know, because as you can see, the person passed away in 1413, and the Hasidic movement didn't start till the 1700s. There was a brief movement for a century or so of Hasidim in Ashkenaz, and most of the Ashkenazi customs come from that group via this Maharash, via Maril, via Rama, people in the chain of, 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 of the tradition of Ashkenaz being passed down. But it comes from these Hasidim. Are you suggesting perhaps a mistake in the Ashkenaz is a place? Ashkenaz means Germany, and it's essentially a broad term for the Rhinelands, which includes, uh, let's say, France, Germany, Austria. and medieval, Austria. Medieval yeah, medieval Germany, not modern Germany. Whereas Farad is, mid is the Iberian Peninsula, right? And that, that, that's the split. Until this is, this is before Ashkenazim went east. Like the Eastern European Ashkenazim that we talk about, Poland or, or farther east, Russia, Ukraine, whatever, is after the, Ukraine, after the Ashkenazi Jews were kicked out of the Rhinelands. Oh. And, and they were invited by the king of Poland, so they went to Poland and they flourished there for many years. And that, that, that Poland actually was partially Ukraine too. So like, so awesome. Yek, Yek is the original Ashkenaz. So Yek is different because Yek is afterwards going yeah. west, right? So we, just, we started off west, we went east, and we went back west, the Ashkenazic community. Anyway, a map. There's a map of it, right? yeah, Google a map of the Ashkenazic traveling. It's quite fascinating. But so this is pre-Eastern European. Actually, post him is when, this, when the Eastern European and Western European starts to split. And his students, we'll see, there's two students in a minute, we'll see uh, one brought the Ashkenazi customs to Eastern Europe and one to Western Europe. So we'll see a little bit about that too. Anyway, so this Reb Maharash was part of the group of people called the Hasidic Ashkenaz, the pious ones of Ashkenaz. We'll get into a minute who they are. Now, even though we do not know, says the editors, if the Maharash himself authored any works in the realm of Kabbalah, because the Hasidic Ashkenaz were Kabbalists. These Hasidic Ashkenaz were Kabbalists. And we also know the fact that he was very scrupulous, not to mix in his halachic rulings, such elements that are of the realm of the mystical. But nonetheless, he does frequently quote from Kabbalistic books. Some of the books that he quotes, we don't even have. So obviously he had access to Kabbalistic works that we don't have today. Right? And uh, in his day-to-day -day practice, Shiliv Kaman Hagis, he incorporated a number of customs, which is connected to the Kabbalistic tradition. Furthermore, Rabbi Yisrael Isselin Hayid, Rabbi Yisrael Isselin uh, testifies a love on the Marash, that the, our master, the Marash, followed a book called the Sefer Hasidim, which was a book of these Hasidic Ashkenaz. So the, he, he lives in the 1400s. 
we said he dies, he dies in 1413, late 1300s, 1400s. And the Hasidic Ashkenaz are really earlier. So he's like the last remnant of the Hasidic Ashkenaz. And the, the main book text of the Hasidic Ashkenaz is a book called Sefer Hasidim, which is a highly influential Kabbalistic work. Much of that Rizal could even be traced back to the Sefer Hasidim. So we're seeing here also the Marash also follow the Sefer Hasidim. Right? And then he goes on to list different places where the Marash quotes from Kabbalistic books. And then he goes on to say in the sec- last paragraph that uh, it would seem to me that this, this work that we're looking at here, the, cust- the collection of customs of the Maharaj was written by his student, Rabbi Yuspa Ostreicher, um, and as well as a lot of the customs in this book are reiterated in the book of the Maharil. The Maharil, which we'll see who he is in a moment, is really the father of all Ashkenazi custom, and the Ramah, right? you know the Shulchan Aruch has divided into two parts, right? the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, is written by Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Riyas of Cairo's Hasfardi. So Rameir Isserlis wrote glosses to the Shulchan Aruch with the Ashkenazic custom. Most of the Ashkenazic custom that Rameir Isserlis's glosses are come from Maharil, which now we're learning come from Maharash, which now we're learning come from the Sefer Hasidim. So which means really the Ashkenazic custom in a lot of ways, in some way, not directly or indirectly, is traced back to this Kabbalistic group. Not all the customs, but certainly many of them. I'm saying that because it would seem to me that this whole pouring of the wine is Kabbalistic in notion, as we're going to see. From the beginning, it's a Kabbalistic idea. This is why, this is why I'm prefacing this whole thing. Mm-hmm. So now I, I just quote from Wikipedia in English who the Hasidim are. The Sefer Hasidim of, or Sefer Hasidim, is a text by Yehuda ben Shmuel of Regzenberg, a foundation work of the teachings of the Hasidic Ashkenaz, the pious ones of Germany. It offers an account of the daily religious uh, life of Jews in medieval Germany and their customs, beliefs, and traditions. It presents the combined teachings of the three leading German, German Hasidic Hasidim during the 12th and 13th century. So it's a little bit before uh, the Maharash, because the Maharash is at the end of the 13th century. Uh, Shmuel the Hasid, Yehuda Hasid, and Elazar Rekeach. Yeah? The Hasidim of Ashkenaz were a Jewish mystical aesthetic movement in the German Rhineland during the 12th and 13th century. The Hasidim's most central tenets concern the, the will of the Creator. They, were, they are obligated to follow the Dine Shemayim, laws of heaven, the devotion were expressed in the both esoteric and perfectionist ways. Their esoteric, their esoteric expression, uh, expression was in their dedication to prayer. They believe that you may rise to spir- spiritually toward communion with God through the knowledge of prayer, which is a very Kabbalistic notion, which is come from Hasidim today. Right? So we're tracing this back to this group of Hasidim, which in some ways you can trace back to Asajj Goyen. You can take it further back if you want to. But this is where we're going as far as this custom goes. Okay. So now, this Maharaj is the first one to mention this custom of dipping your finger into the wine and throwing the wine out. As you say, the 10 plagues. And he reads as follows, top of page five. So this is, remember, the, uh, the book is a book of customs of the Maharaj compiled by a student, Rabbi Yusba Ostreicher. So Rabbi Yusba Ostreicher writes about his teacher, the Maharaj. When my master, the Maharash would say the ten plagues, dams for kingdom, and so on. Hoya Mason Metz Boy Bakois, Shalafanov, he would put his finger into the cup that's in front of him, Bakol Palm each time. But Omar Lee and the Maharash told me, Shekain Kosava Avi Ezri, that so too is written in a book called Avi Ezri. We'll see what that is in a moment. Now, Ukhshiyativ in Metz Boy Bakol Palm at Lachutz, and every time he would sprinkle or, or sprinkle, throw some of the wine outside of his cup. The Omar, and the Barash tells me, it seems to say, Shatam, that the reason for why we're dipping our finger and splinking it out, it's, it's almost as if like, the Barash isn't saying, oh, here's a, here's a good custom I think you should do because of X reason. But rather, this is a custom I saw from the Avi Ezri. Now, it would seem to me that the reason for that is X. Following the reason coming after the practice, not the other way around. All right, following? Namely, Shatam Kalaymar are... Our reason is, because we are as if saying, we call Ela from all of these things, the Dom, the Tzvardeya, the kingdom, all these plagues, Yatsileinu Hashem, God should save us from all these things. So we throw it out, saying that these things, not for us, Hashem should save us from these things. Atam, and the reason is, the, ten, the four cups of water were established as salvation for the Jewish people. And for the opposite of salvation, Talkala means like uh, blunder, for the nations of the world. And therefore, Zodek, he throws the wine out with his finger. I mean to say, that we should be saved from these plagues. Let it be on their heads. 
This is the earliest source for this practice. These things that we're talking about, the plagues, not for us, for those guys. We're throwing it on them. That's what he says here. Okay. So now let's go to the, the table here. And we'll see uh, five different sources. by just giving you a list of where they are. And you can see as it's spread around throughout the communities. So the, the earliest source we have is, I just quoted from the Marash. But the Marash says that I heard it from Avi Ezri. Right? So Avi Ezri is in the first text there. And Belezi ben Yoyal, we die, he died sometime after 1220. 12, 12, so he's really in the thick of the time of the, Sefer, of the Hasidic movement, right? The Hasidic Ashkenaz, as we said, was in the 13th and 14th century. So if he dies right after 1220, he's right there in this Hasidic movement. And here's the interesting part. The Marash says that I saw this custom from the Avia Ezri. But in the Avia Ezri, as we have it printed, we don't, know, we don't have this section which is not uncommon because we already read before from the introduction that the Maharaj was quoting books that we don't know about. So it's quite possible. He had a, he had a version of the Avi Ezri, which included this custom, which is no longer extant. Right? Especially since the Maharaj didn't even see him. Because as we said before, the Maharaj lived in page three, and died in 1413. And, um, and, uh, and, and the Avi Ezri died sometime in 1220. So it's, Unless Maharaj lived for a very long time, he never saw the Aviyah Ezri, which means he had a book from the Aviyah Ezri that, uh, that we don't have, or some version of the book that we don't have. Is that clear so far? Who? Aviyah Ezri? Yeah, almost, yeah. Rambam was a little bit before that, yeah. So he's a Rishi. If I'm not mistaken, he was a, the teacher of the Rosh. We learned uh, from the Rosh last week, the famous Rosh, the father of the Torah. If I'm not mistaken, he's a teacher of the Rosh. Okay, so the next people down, the next two boxes, you see Ben Moshe Levi Moilin, Yaakov Ben Moshe Levi Moilin, that's the Maharil. This is the, the, prime, the prodigal student of the Maharash. And he wrote a book called uh, Sefer Menhagim, and over here called Seder Haggadah, which is a section of the Sefer Menhagim. And he quotes his teacher, the Maharash, quoting Avi Ezri to do this custom of sprinkling the thing. And Rama, and Moser Isilis, would quote from Maharil, who's quoting from Maharash. And then the other student here is Yitzchak Isaac of Tirna. So as you can see, I wrote for Yitzchak Isaac of Tirna. He's in Eastern Europe. So the Maharil became, so, so the Maharash is like the, 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 almost the original source taken from the Sefer Hasidim and others of Ashkenazic custom. And then from him, you get two students, two primal students, the Maharil and Yitzchak Isaac of Tirna. And these two students, one in Eastern Europe and one in Western Europe. So the Eastern Europe tradition would be from Minhagi Tirna, like the Earlier, early original Ukrainian Minhagim, which is the broadly the Eastern European tradition, is from Yitzhak Isaac of Turna. And then the Western side, which would be from the Maharil, is in Germany, it's the Western side. And then finally, we have it in the Ramah. Now, the next text I have is from a book called, from a, from a, a, a Yid named Chaim Ben Veniste. Now, he is a little bit after all of the above mentioned, and he is in Turkey. Now, wh why I quoted him is because I wanted to see, I knew this was the Sephardic custom, that the Sephardic custom also is to remove some wine from the cup. But as you see here, the custom originates deep in Ashkenaz thought and land, right? So I want to see when and where did it move to the Sephardic side. So who's my go-to guy? My go-to rabbi for this kind of thing would be Rabbi Yaakov Joseph. Rabbi Avadi Yosef's son wrote a book called Yaakov Joseph. And the Avadi Yosef and his sons are renowned for vast source, sourcing. So I went to see his customs and to see what he writes there. So he writes this custom to dip with the finger, but doesn't quote the Maharil, doesn't quote the Maharash. He quotes this rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Benaviste. Now when you read the Chaim Benaviste, he quotes the Maharash and the Maharil. <laughs> but... But, but, Rabbi Yosef, but, but Rabbi Yosef wouldn't. And my guess is, this is my guess, because Rabbi Chaim ben Avisti is one of the leading Sephardic thinkers, shapers of Sephardic custom. He wrote a book called Knesset Sagdola, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. And he shared Knesset Sagdola, and he became like the, the molding of the Sephardic custom. The Chida says to write, to, to quote from, the, from him. So I'm assuming that when Rabbi Yosef wants to tell his community that this is our custom, he's not going to quote from the Ashkenazi source. He's going to quote from the Sephardic source, even though the Sephardic source itself quotes the Ashkenazic source. 
right? Because he wants to establish that this is a Sephardic custom. This is my understanding, right? Which is why I wrote in the box on the right, it comes from a book called Pesach uh, Muavin, which we'll quote in a minute. This is a book written by the same author, quoted in Yaakov Joseph, which is a modern, modern Sephardic book of custom. That's why I was asking you what the custom was there, because you're going to see Yaakov Joseph and the uh, Pesach Muavin is not the way you do it. He's with the finger, not with the hand. Okay, so now the next two texts. Okay, we're not gonna learn the next text, we don't need to, that's not so important. Um, okay, let's go to page six. Page six. Now we come to the Altar of So, this is all background to get to the Rebbe Sagada. So let's understand the context of the Rebbe Sagada. We spoke about it briefly in our first class, but let's understand it again, because it's gonna be important for the flow of what's going to happen here. So the Altar Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, of course, wrote two halachic works that we have today. Number one is a Shulchan Aruch, and number two is a Siddur. He actually wrote the Shulchan Aruch twice. The second version of the Shulchan Aruch, we have almost nothing of it. And even the first version of the Shulchan Aruch, we're missing large chunks. It's not a halachic work. Not a halachic work. Time is not a halachic work, yeah? You said that a Yankov Yosef, that also heard of Yankov Shmoni. Yankov Shmoni is like way earlier. That's a Midrashic source. But it could be a Yankov Yosef was playing the, on that name. What's the term Yankov mean? Yankov means collection. Yeah, like Lakute. Like Lakute. Okay. Sorry? Yaakov Joseph. This is Yaakov Joseph. Sorry? Yaakov is a school bag? Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Okay, so the Altar again were two halachic works, the Shulchan Aruch and the Siddur. So the Shulchan Aruch is a code of Jewish law. Yeah? And that was intended to be universal. He wrote it at the behest of his, his teacher, the Magad of Mezuch, and it was intended to be universal. So the, the Alter Rebbe, for the most part, sticks to um, halachic thinking, not as opposed to Kabbalistic thinking, more halachic thinking, follows largely the Magad Avraham, who's a halachic decisor of an earlier generation. But in the other work, which is the Siddur, right, writing, let's explain what this means, writing a Siddur. Writing a Siddur means you... Dalteva had, I think, 70 or something like that, some huge number of Siddurim in front of him, read through all of them, and cherry picked what would be the best version of Davening. Didn't write his own version of Davening, but he assessed what would be the best version from all the various different extant versions. And he did so, he built the Siddur following A, grammar, B, halacha, and C, Kabbalah. Creating a Siddur that would follow all these three things. Sometimes they come, into, they come and clash. In grammar, you should be this way, but halacha says you should do something like that. Or um, Kabbalistically, you should be doing this. But the halacha, if you follow the Gemara, would go this way, right? And the Alter Rebbe crafted a Siddur that would follow all of these in the best possible manner. Now, like anybody who wrote and published a Siddur, you have instructions of what you should do. Like, pick up your scissors here, touch your tefillin here, yeah? Uh, stand here, sit here, right? And you also go through the cycle of the year. So before the Shabbos davening, you would have a whole section on brief laws of Shabbos. Before Sefer Saimer, brief laws of Sefer Saimer. Before the Hanukkah, brief laws of Hanukkah. Are you following? That's what a siddur looks like. Open up your siddur here. It says instructions of the halacha. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Salter wrote that. And in this siddur, there's a haggadah. And in the haggadah, there's instructions. Raise your cup here. Put your cup down here. Cover the matzah here. All the instructions. So a few times he wrote how to meditate. We're going to get to this, yes. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that, yes. We're going to get there. I hope you get there. <laughs> we are going to get there. I hope. That's a, it's very interesting. Yes, yes we're going to get there. Let's go. We'll get there. Yeah? Are you with me so far in what's happening? So you have the Siddur and you have the Shulchan Aruch. Yeah? So the Rebbe's Haggadah is a commentary on the Alter Rebbe's Haggadah with the comments from the, from the Alter Rebbe. Okay? Say that again? The Rebbe's Haggadah oh. is a commentary on the Alter Rebbe's Haggadah. Right? right? Including commentary on the Alter Rebbe's comments of what you should do at which point. Right. Which is what we're going to get to now. Comments on commentary. That's right. First, we're going to see the Alter Rebbe's instruction in the Shulchan Aruch, what he says to do in terms of removing the wine. Then we're going to see what the Alter Rebbe says in the Siddur with regard to removing the wine. And then we'll see the Rebbe's comment on what the Alter Rebbe said in the Siddur. And that, this is where we're going. You clear? And that's the, okay, uh, the black leather bound one? Know, some could be black leather bound, some be purple. Either. No, but I mean, like, there's an Alter Rebbe's Siddur that's like black. It's the, it's one version. There's, there's, there's many colors. Every city you have is Dalta Basidur. The Torah, the discussion is Dalta Basidur. 
Yeah, every Siddur, the Chabad Siddur is Alter Siddur. Colors. So no, no, I'm saying that I know, I know what you're talking about. That that's Torah. It's a certain version. Are you talking about that one? The Torah is a certain version which has its own history, <laughs> but but it's, but it's one version of the Alta B'Shachanoro, Alta B'Siddur. Okay, so let's see the Alta B'Shachanoro here. This is in um, Tafayin Gimel, which is 473, section 473. At the end of that chapter, that chapter discusses the laws of what to do between the second and third cup, which is basically the whole Magid. So it goes through all the customs of Magid, and then the Alta B'Shachanoro is like this. During the recitation of that God, it is customary to sprinkle a bit of the wine from one's cup when one reaches the phrase, quote, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. When he mentioned the ten plagues by name, and similarly, when he mentions them in groupings, i.e., tatsach, adash, bachav, so then sprinkling a bit of wine for each word, sprinkling a total of 16 times. The Hebrew letters, yudvav, which is 16, have a numerical value of 16, and thus recall the sword of the Holy One, blessed be he. This is called yoyach. This is the name of the angel charged with executing vengeance. So this is item number one, which he gets from the Ramah, which he gets from the Ramah. We skip the text of the Ramah, but this he gets from the Ramah. And the Ramah adds that the sprink, till now we saw the sprinkling of the wine is what? Because let the wrath be on our enemies, not on us. We're throwing it at them. Now we're adding a new layer. It's 16 times we're sprinkling, right? Three for the columns of smoke, three for the... Uh, for the Datsach Hadash Bacha for the abbreviation, and 10 for the plague, 16 total. 16 is the name of the angel that's responsible for vengeance. So this is act of vengeance. Engines, you go that way. Vengeance, you go that way. That's what we're doing, either with the index finger or the pinky finger, which he says now in 51. It is customary to sprinkle a small amount of the wine from the cup with the finger that is closest to the thumb, i.e. the index finger. This finger is referred to as etzba without any further description, meaning some, people, some fingers are called the thumb finger. Uh, the middle finger. But then when you say finger, without any prefix or suffix, what you mean is the index finger. This is at least in Hebrew, in etzba. Yeah. And in this, thus it recalls the verse, which says, it is the finger of God, etzba lekimi. So use the finger. In other words, as far as custom one goes, which is to get rid of the negative, you can do it by pouring also. Right? As far as halacha 50 goes, and it's just about getting rid of the vengeance and throwing the vengeance on them, well, you can throw it out of your cup directly. You don't have to use a finger. So why finger? Ah, because finger of God. Yeah. Others are accustomed to sprinkle the wine with the finger called kamitza, the ring finger. Oh, I thought it was the uh, pinky finger. Sorry, ring finger. Because I was reading the Hebrew and I always thought kamitza is the pinky. Okay, it's the ring finger. Uh, because it is the finger, this is the finger that the Holy One, blessed be, struck Egyptians. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I, I was wrong. I kept reading it in the Hebrew and thought it was the, the pinky. It's the ring finger. My apologies. Okay. There's there, a custom of using it. Yeah, we do the pinky. Yeah, it's a huge customer. Oh, uh, yeah? Pinky. So there you go. I'm not off. But here it says ring finger. Okay, good. Big exactly. Yeah. Pinky, big, not the, uh, yeah, the pinky. Yeah, these are pinky. Maybe, maybe Kamitsa is the big. I, I always thought the Kamitsa was the pinky. I think you're right. Yeah, I, I'm saying, I don't know. Hard this translation from Chabad.org, you're pretty good. Yeah. Sorry? Use the pinky. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, so there you go. We learned it, but she's using the pinky. Yeah. So there you go. Sure. I, no, so you see here also it says, uh, Kamitza, she ate Zlatana, oh, the one near the smallest one, means the ring finger. Also when they point to the Torah during, uh, the Spartan point thing. The Spartan point thing. Yeah, the Spartan point thing. Yeah, the Spartan point thing. I'm sorry, but over here, Taka, I'm looking at this book, whatever, this book of collecting of customs. Here it says Kamitza, and it says, she ate Zlatana, the one next to the small one, which is the ring finger, yeah? Just the ring finger. Okay, because this is the finger that the Holy One Blessed be He used to struck the Egyptians. Okay. There are some who pour the wine from the cup itself because of esoteric reasons known to them and not to sprinkle it with the finger without giving any explanation. So if you were to read this alone and not read the Siddur, you would assume the primary way to do it is to use your finger, depending which one. He just mentions, by the way, there are some people who pour it out for reasons known to them. So again, the Shulchan Aruch, as I mentioned before, is meant to be universal. And this is universal custom. But the Siddur, the Atabah changes it. And the Siddur, the Atabah goes with a different custom. So let's go to the top of page seven. And let's see, custom two. I wrote custom one, it's a mistake. It's supposed to be custom two. But before we go to that, let's look at the Pesach Mu'uvin. This is the Sephardic, the early Sephardic uh, halachic uh, authority. The author of the Knesset, the other one who's quoted by the Alka Yosef, the Sephardic source from Turkey, to use the finger to pour out the wine. He says like this, Okay, he doesn't quote the Marash, he quotes the Maril. Maril quotes the Marash. Anyway, so the, it is a custom 
based on the Rekeach and the Maril. It's brought in another book. We get to the point of blood, fire, and columns of smoke. And to the ten plagues. Call Eser Makis, all the ten plates. Ube de Tzach Adash Bachab, and when we do the abbreviation, Lahat Bel Etzbak Tana Bakais, to put the small finger into the cup. So maybe this is where the pinky comes from. To put the small finger. The Lizra is Chutza, and to throw it out. Lizra Chutza to throw it outside. Pam Achas, Bechol Mila. At one time for each word. Bein Akol, totaling Yudva Pamim 16 times. Neged Yudva Pamim, corresponding to 16 different. Directions or punim, angles. Anyway. Okay, but well, the intention is Loimar to say, let God save us from all of these things, all the plagues. Let the plagues fall upon those who hate God. Now, my father used to do this. And to the and to the benefactor, wealthy one, my father-in-law, he also used to do this. I saw also. Here's an interesting custom which is not mentioned so far. And not mentioned in the Ramah either. But the Yaakov Joseph does mention it. That after they spilled, after they removed these drops, they would empty out the wine from their cups. They would clean out their cups. And they would put new wine into the cup. And they would wash their hands. And I do the same thing. Now, why? Why is my father-in-law doing this? And why am I doing this? Emptying out the cup, washing my hands, and washing the cup out. The Yid of would seem to me, says the Pesach Mo'avim, says uh, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Chaim Benavisti, this Italian Sephardic rabbi. The Yid of it seems to me, Shatam Sayayin, the reason for emptying out the wine, we don't want to drink wine upon which we recited plagues. And the gam hit let's boy, you also dip your finger into it. So which means you dip your finger into the wine, you sprinkle it, you put your finger back in. So there's back in there wine that you sprinkled. And this whole thing is like cursed wine, so to speak. And therefore, get rid of it, wash your hands, because your hands also have that wine on you, and start fresh. Chabad? No. Dafka not, you fill it up right away, we'll see soon. We say dafka not, we'll see soon. I was always brandished for licking my finger afterwards. And say, you can't lick it. No, that's right. The gam is from, so, so that's reason number one. Reason number one is because we just recited per- curses. We don't want to be drinking a cup of curses. Number two, the gam is from meals, also because it's kind of disgusting. It's not nice. Your fingers are dirty and you put your fingers back in. Mizatam, for this reason, we wash our cup out and we wash our hands. So again, I don't, I don't see this in the Ramon, so I don't think it's a uh, uh, Ashkenazi custom. Maybe there is. If someone's listening and knows of other communities that do this, we'd love to hear. But it seems like this is the Sephardic custom. At least as quoted in the Yaakov Joseph, it directly quotes from this Siddur. How about Okay, so now I, I'm, I'm taking this down the journey because what we're getting here is like this. The ikir of the custom is this is what we don't understand right now. The ikir of the custom is Hashem's anger should go on the Goyim, not to us. Good. How do you do it? Okay, well, there are more suggested finger, and we saw this melted out of it because the plagues were God's finger. Now, if you're using your finger, you have two issues now. First of all, it's disgusting, these germs. A. B, the cup of wine is cursed. And you gotta empty it out. So now in our custom, where we don't use our finger, we clean it, we pour it out. The issue of disgust doesn't exist because we're pouring it out. Yeah. But the issue of cursed water, cursed wine still, still seemingly exists. It's still wine of a curse. We're gonna see why it's not. But this is what you might think now. That I was taking us on a journey to understand. That's why I'm going down this way, because what they're going to teach us is that in our version, the wine left in the cup is not cursed. On the contrary, it's joyous wine. And we're going to explain why that is. We're going to see, we're going to see why that is. We're going to see why that is. But that's where I'm going. Yeah. But we're going to see why that is, because this is, this is where we're going. So I'm building, we're building to this case. Following? Okay, so let's see custom number two. Number one, we pour it into a broken vessel. So no, custom number two is pour directly out, not finger. Number one. Now, as a result... We also pour it into a vessel specifically. Best case, a broken vessel, and even better case, put the broken vessel on the floor. Then I tell you, Gabriel, Rabbi Gabriel Taylor writes that a plastic cup is as good as a broken cup. I'm not convinced, but maybe. Uh, number two is, in this custom, we don't need to empty out the wine after. 
the after we're done doing the pouring, we don't have to empty out the wine from the, we don't have to empty out the remainder of the cup, the wine. How can you empty it into a broken vessel from the outside? So you have a crack on the top. It doesn't have to be uh, broken all the way. It's a little chip. That's so you have, you have, you have a chipped uh, plate, a chipped uh, bowl poured into there. Yeah. Now, number three is, do I have to know the intention behind it when I do the custom? Or is it a nice thing to know the intention? Till now, no one said you have to know the intention. In fact, everybody said, this is the custom. And it seems to me the reason is because X. And if you didn't know the reason, and if it was a different reason, so, so what? But in our custom, we're going to see from the Alter Rebbe, and from the Rebbe, that you actually have to, know the, you have to know the reason. And if you don't know the reason, it can mess you up completely. You have to understand the intention. This is going to be the Hidrish of the Alter Rebbe and then the Rebbe. That understanding the reason behind our version of porn, which is not the same thing as what we've learned till now. That understanding that is why we don't have to wash the cup out and why the cup is not cursed. It's going to become a beautiful uh, sort of meditation, as we'll see. This is where we're going, yeah? Clear? Let's go right there. I don't understand that. It's easy because if you dip your finger in and you put it, in, you put it into a plate or a glass, yeah. Your finger is still wet with the wine. That's why you said to wash it. Yeah. Wine, so it goes back in. That, exactly. Exactly. That's why that's why the spartans, that's why Rabbi the Rabbi uh, the Pesach Mov in that book said to clean it out. But because we're pouring it, we don't have to do that. But there's still the issue of the, the curse, seemingly, maybe. Let's see why that's not the case. Okay, so first of all, let's say this. Now let's see the Alter Rebbe's Siddur, which is Alter Rebbe's Agada. His instruction at this point in his Agada. Yeah? With me we so far where we are? Yeah, with me. Page seven. When you get to the words, uh, blood, fire, and color, color smoke, yeah? Can we explain why it needs to be a broken vessel? We will. We will. When we get to the words, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, you should pour out three uh, pourings. Don't use your finger to pour out, says the Alter Ben the Siddur. Even though in the Shulchan Aruch he gave the reason why you should use the finger, because it's the finger of God. Here he says, do not use your finger. Use the actual cup to pour it out. The yishbach l'tayf kli shavar and pour it into a broken cup, broken vessel. Now says the Alter Rebbe, v'yichavin, and that shall have in mind. Now this is very unique, as we're going to see from the Rebbe's comment. I mentioned before that Alter Rebbe Siddur, he collected all these Siddurim and comprised and compiled the perfect Siddur based on grammar, halacha, and Kabbalah. Now, there are many, many Kabbalistic Siddurim. We're going, to, we're going to cite to one soon. A Kabbalistic Siddur essentially is someone who learns through all the Arizal's writings. And every time the Arizal says that this is the meaning of this prayer, this is the meaning of that prayer, this is what you should be thinking in that prayer, he writes a Siddur and writes, think this here, think this here, based on what the Arizal taught. So most Arizal Siddurim are latent with instruction, think this here, think this there, think this there. al Rebbe Siddur has none of that. So it has all the, cap- it's built on the Kabbalistic writings that he's out without informing the reader why it's there or how it's the Kabbalistic reading. Just stating what to do and what to read based on the Arizal's Kabbalistic me- meaning without telling you, the reader, what the Kabbalistic meanings are. Because the would not want, to, would not want to confuse the one praying. He wanted the Siddur to be universal. Yeah. Well, we yeah. learned is that there is like, there is a, even that brown and orange one says that as illuminated by Kassidus and there's like, and colors and sections yeah. and colors. You should not dive in that. They exactly. do not want you to dive in that. You don't want to dive. That's right. You're not going to get through that. You're just going to be yeah. distracted. Rebbe Daf did not want. Rebbe Daf did not want that sedurim that are used for davening should have commentary. Right. Focus on the on the prayer on the words, pronouncing them correctly, and the translation. That's it. That's right. But there are three times in the Alter Rebbe does include Kabbalistic thought processes. One is every time it says Ana B'Kayach. Ana B'Kayach does Mincha. So it says, while you're reading it, you should envision the letters that are written there on the left. The Aleph, Ez, Gimel, those letters. Yeah? That's one Kabbalistic contention. Another one is, when we do Hod L'Hashem Kitev Kilom Chazdai, Hod L'Hashem Kitev Kilom Chazdai, before Hader Samuna on Shabbos, yeah. you see the letters of Hashem's name. The first ten, Yud. Next ten, uh, Hey. Next six, Vav. Next five, Hey. Another Kabbalistic thing, that these are the letters of Hashem's name. And the third instruction is right here by the Abad. I don't know if there's a fourth one. If someone knows the fourth one, correct me. So this is the instruction that Rebbe says here at this point. Doesn't say to think anything. But it's across it. Read the words. Doesn't say anywhere that shall think the following during these words. Right. right? But here it does. Now here it says, while you're pouring out the wine, be chavin, you should have in mind. Shakois, who said a malchus. Oh, an asterisk. 
So I think the translation, not Kabbalistic intention. No, it says uh, you have to focus intently on these, on these words. On the translation. Not, yeah. No Kabbalistic meanings. It doesn't say this corresponds to that attribute of divine. Oh, right. Just to focus on the translation of the words. Open up your hand and provide. Right. It's basic translation. It's not Kabbalistic. And that's halacha requirement. It's halacha requirement to think of the translation during that line. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's halacha. But well, what if the translation is another tongue? You don't need to translate it. So then don't translate it. Just know the meaning. Know the meaning. Peter Shamilus, the meaning of the words. Right. Okay. So, it says out there, but here's the instruction now. While you're, here's the instruction of what you should contemplate when you're pouring the wine out. And hopefully, we'll explain what this Kabbalistic meaning is soon. Okay. V'yechavin, you should have in mind. Shakois, you say the malchus. The cup corresponds to malchus. I, I will explain, God willing, what all these things mean. But now, just the facts. The cup is malchus. V'shoifich ma'yayin shibesayich, right? And you're pouring out from some of the wine that's inside of malchus. It's inside the cup. Which is anger and wrath. Which comes from the power of Bina. We'll see soon what exactly Bina is producing. Is Bina producing the wrath? We're going to learn soon, no. The Bina does not produce the wrath, but Bina produces the power to pour out the wrath. That's what we're going to learn soon. Because if you read the text here, you would think that the, ang- the wrath comes through the power of Bina. But that, the, the Rebbe is going to give us a comment soon that it means that the, with the power of Bina, you pour the wrath out of Malchus. I'll explain how that is and why that is. And where are you pouring this wrath to? The Toich Klishover, to a broken vessel. Because klip, the broken vessel is Klippa, Shanikra Ora, which is called cursed. Isn't it also a broken vessel is no longer Tame? Or is that not something? Maybe it's related, but the broken vessel is, represents Klippa. That's why broken. So what are, we, what are we thinking then? We're thinking that the cup is Malchus, and I'm using the power of Bina. I'll explain what that means to use the power of Bina. But you're using the power of Bina to get rid of anger from Malchus and to give Malchus to Klippa. Give the anger to Klippa. So what am I really doing here in this pouring? I'm, I'm not, it's not a cor- pouring of a curse. It's not a pouring of a curse. It's a pouring of cleansing. The wine right now in Malchus has a mixture of a little bit of wrath in there. So I'm using Bina to get rid of the wrath, making the wine that's left over Perfect and beautiful, without anger free. So it's not the process of wine of curse. The whole process of pouring is cleansing my my wine that it shouldn't have any anger left in it. Using the power of bina. That's why bina. That's why you have to understand it. We'll see some of why. That's why, the vehicle by which. That, that's right. So I'm going to explain how that how that vehicle of bina works to help you get rid of anger. We'll see how that is. It's a beautiful teaching. We'll see. But now let's get to the fact. I'm already reading into this the way they ever taught me to read into it from their best comment, but you'll see it. I'm building it from this way. So let's see. And then the author continues. Bamidis eser makis, when you get to it. So this he said when you're doing dam ve'es, simus ashen, blood, fire, and common smoke. Now, bamidis eser makis, when it comes to the 10 plagues, yishbech eser shvichas, you should pour 10 pourings. Makis asks me again from the, from the cup itself, canal as mentioned before. Ve'yechavim bishvichah gamkin canal. And when you're pouring the 10 plagues, think the same thing. Cup is malchus. And I'm using the power of Bina to get rid of the anger, so that the anger goes to Klippa. Umashanisha Bakois, and whatever is left behind in the cup, Nasa so Yainam Samayach is now joyous wine, because I've gotten rid of all the anger. Lakach lo Yishbaich, and therefore do not empty out your glass of wine. You don't want to ruin that wine, you just purify it. It's like been through the mix. El Yosef, you've been through the mix. El Yosef Yain, add wine. So we're as in the first practice, for the reason is, use your finger and sprinkle it out. Because you're saying, this terrible thing, throw it to them. So this whole wine is terrible. Clean it out, wash out your cup, wash your hands. Whereas here, we're pouring it out. Not because we want to, God's vengeance or anything. No mention of God's vengeance. The 16, number 16, which is God's vengeance. No mention of that. No mention of God's, of, of, of uh, nations of the world. It's cleansing Whatever Malchus contains, whatever Malchus is, it contains, using the power of Bina to cleanse Malchus, that it's rid of all anger. So now I have perfect and pristine joy. So the whole process of removing the wine is a cleansing process more than it is to push the anger anywhere else. The point is to cleanse the cup so that my content is all joyous. How do I make it joyous? By using Bina to get anger out into the clipper. And thus I'm left with perfect joy. And if I'm left with perfect joy, refill the wine. Don't empty it out. Fair? So now let's see from the Rebbe. I'm not going to go through all of the Rebbe's comments because it's, there's a lot. Does, does, does. Let's go to 
page eight. Sorry? I was going to say, ask if, um, if you pour it out in something other than a broken vessel, does this? It doesn't discount it. I don't, discount? Think it I don't think it discounts it. But uh, it's best than a broken vessel. Okay, so bottom of page eight, the last paragraph there. The Rebbe, I'm skipping some of the other Rebbe's comments because time, time is uh, the essence here. But so let's look at the last comment here from the Rebbe here. The Ain lit on page eight. You have it there, the last, the last paragraph. The Ain little be etzba lishbar ki in because atzmai. The Rebbe quotes the Alter Rebbe in his Siddur, which said, don't use your finger to spill out the wine, but use the cup itself. And he quotes one, two, three, four, five sources. So on the next page, on page nine, I have a little table there with all the sources that are recites to you. So you can get an idea of where they come from and where they are. And the earliest sources you can see here is the Arizal, who lives in Svas in 1534 to 1572, which is almost 100 years after the Maril we said before is in the 1400s. Right? Maril's in the 1400s. And here the earliest custom for the pouring is Arizal. So is, does this mean that the Ardizal is modifying the Mardil's custom or a different custom entirely? I can't say for sure, but the Rebbe does not quote one source that discusses the other version, which is the finger. Except for in passing, he mentions the Alter Rebbe for something else. And he also quotes a source, the Sheva Chav Pesach, which I quote on this text later, which does quote the source for sprinkling the finger and says, don't do that. But here you can see all the different sources of this custom to use the, to use to pour it out. And you can see the earliest one is Narizal. But if you look at the citation on the right, Narizal didn't write any uh, books. All of his books were, are transcripts from a student of Chaim Vital, which is called Pri Eitz Chaim. Now this particular comment to pour is not even in Pri Eitz Chaim itself. It's on a comment from, as you can see on the bottom, Hagoy Semach, from a person who died in the 1600s. 1676, he quotes that I heard from someone who said that the Ardiza would pour rather than sprinkle. And that's where the custom comes from. And ev all the other sources afterwards are all taken from there. From this comment by the Hagoy Semach, um, who said that I heard, I heard from one wise person who told me that the Ardiza would pour rather than use his finger. That's the source of the custom. In the 16, uh, from a fellow who died, from a Yid who died in 1667, which is way after the Maril, almost 200 years after the Maril. So the custom to use the finger way predates the custom to pour out. But the custom to pour out is specifically an Arizal idea, very Kabbalistic, as you can see. The first one with the finger, I, I'm convinced it's also Kabbalistic. Because as we saw, the Maharaj said, they were Kabbalists, they were Kabbalists to begin with because they were from the Kharkisidi Ashkenaz. And the Maharaj says, not this is the reason why I should do it, but it would seem to me the reason is because of God's wrath. But especially in Arizal, it's definitely a capitalistic thing and diverging from what the Maril did. Maril said to get rid of the anger. And we're learning from Arizal, no, it's about purifying the glass that should all be joyous and so on. What if you had the same yeah. intention? What if you modified it, used your finger, but had the intention of the pouring out? You couldn't. So you, couldn't you can't do that because it has to, come out, has to come out from the cup, which is Malchus. And you have to do the power of Bina, whatever that is. Can't mess with the intentions by doing another custom. But we're going to see why the Rebbe is going to say, well, you have to have the intention. And why the Alter Rebbe said you have to have the intention. Let's see. So, but, so when, right, that's what I'm saying. You can't just to, to do the custom of finger, but then have the intention of not, I, I don't think it matches. I don't think it matches. But to me, they seem like almost two different customs almost. Okay. So, I'm not going to read the Shabbat HaPesach, even though I wanted to, but let's go to page 10. 11, sorry, there was comment. Just trying to keep some Shalom bite in the house. You know? What? Be the only one pouring and everybody's like, hey, what are you doing? No, 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 no. <laughs> the Arach HaShulchan family says, the Ovid Kamar Ovid, the Ovid Kamar Ovid. You do like this, you do like that, it's all good. It's, it, it, stick to your, Shalom bias comes before any of this stuff. Are you like Arach HaShulchan from? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so let's see now the, Al the Rebbe's comment on the Alter Rebbe. So the Alter Rebbe said, V'yechav and you should have in mind. So writes the Rebbe. Admur, the Rebbe, meaning the Alter Rebbe, v'sidurah in his Siddur, top page 11, in darkai levar mar she'yechav. It's not his custom to tell us what to have in mind. As I noted, only three times, to the best of my knowledge, only three times the Alter Rebbe gives an instruction of what you should think. Yeah. Now, Masha Khan, 
Why here the Alter Rebbe chose to explain what you should think? Nearly, it would seem to me, says the Rebbe, or near Loimar would seem to say, now I just, I'm pointing out parenthetically that at the end of this whole comment, skip to the end for a second, the last, the parentheses at the end, it says, Yoyin Shar HaKarlo. Look at the Sarah Shar HaKarlo. Shar HaKarlo is a book I have here, written by the Rebbe's great-grandfather, which happens to also be my great, 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 great grandfather. Hmm. Shara Kailo, Rabbi Avram David Lavavut. He wrote a book called the Shara Kailo, which is basically a running commentary on the Alter Rebbe Siddur. He was the first one to properly go through the Alter Rebbe Siddur, point out the details of the customs and the backgrounds and the reasons. Now, when it comes to this juncture, with the Alter Rebbe tells us to have in mind a certain intention, which is highly unusual, so the Shara Kailo also comments. He gives a very similar comment to the Rebbe. But the Rebbe doesn't cite it as a source. The Rebbe says, look there. Remember I said this last time, that when the Rebbe quotes a source, he just puts, the, just, just puts the title, just puts the name of the book. But when he says, investigate there, it means look into it, you'll see it's not exactly the same. So I'm just noting that out. The Rebbe's speaking on his own behalf, but it's not exactly like his grandfather, but similar to his grandfather. And, and it, there's a few nuanced differences, and I think that, it, it, I think those nuanced differences make a big difference. But I'm just noting that maybe another, another occasion will compare, another occasion, I'll, I'll, we'll copy texts of both of them and compare how the Shara Kailo writes it, how the Rebbe writes it, and you'll see how it's different. Okay, so what does the Rebbe say? Nidr Loimar, it seems to say, the Alter Rebbe was compelled to tell us what to think. Because Omar Azal, our sages say in the Gemara and Brachas, I quote the Gemara on the next page, you can have a look at that later. The Gemara says, One may not make a blessing over a cup of catastrophe, a cup of curses. What's a cup of curses? So here we're learning what's a cup of curses because you're making, you're stating, uh, um, what's it called? Plagues. Plagues, cup of curses. Yeah. But the Gemara actually doesn't even talk about that. But the Gemara talks about something called zugais. You should learn this in Plachim about zugais, yeah? Pairs. Right? Pairs. 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 The Gemara tells us that there was a, there is a negative spiritual energy associated with doing things in pairs. So don't drink two glasses of wine. Two bread. cups of bread. Okay, why we don't why we not why we don't care for it today? We'll get into that another time. Maybe the Gemara says in Psachim called Le Kopte Le Kop Bade. Whoever doesn't care about it, it doesn't care about them. Like dreams. And that's yeah, true. yeah. But anyway, that's what it says there. So therefore, the Gemara says, don't drink two cups of gla- glass in a row because Ein Mavarich and Al Kosha Pranis. You shouldn't be making a blessing over a cup of catastrophe. Drinking your second cup in a row, your pears. That's a catastrophe. But here, the Rebbe is borrowing it, and the Shara Kailo also borrows it to tell us why you shouldn't be drinking from the cup, why, why you have to have this intention. Because if you don't have this intention, then your cup is indeed a cup of curses. But because you have the intention that you're cleansing the cup by getting rid of the negative, it's no longer a cup of curses. So if not, never have to tell you to have the intention. Because if you don't have the intention, you turn the cup into a cup of curses. And a cup of curses, you may not make a bracha. That's what they were about to explain. It's the second cup. You had to make anything yet. You filled it up, you haven't done anything yet. All you've been doing is reciting Nagada. But now you've got the curses on the cup. Yeah? So let's see that his words. A Mavarakan al Kosha Paranis, the Gemara says. Sorry, that may also be why in the first instance they dump it out and pour it in. That's back. exactly right. So let's see. So A Mavarakan al Kosha Paranis, the Gemara says, don't make a blessing on a cursed cup. Will be safer Pesach Mo'oven. And the book called Pesach Mo'oven, which we read earlier, which was the Sephardic uh, rabbi quoted by the Alka Joseph. Who says, Kosav, he writes, the Yishayfkenayayim, you should pour out the wine, and this year it's left behind. The Shayfkenakos, and you wash out the cup and your hands. But there was not concerned with that here because we aren't using our fingers, we're pouring. There was concerned with the cup itself being cursed. So indeed, this book, Pesach Mo'ovin, says to, and so does Yaakov Joseph say to do, to empty out the cup and wash it out. And said the Pesach Mo'ovin, Mishumshin Niskashim Hamakas, because you've recited the, the plagues. He didn't cite to this Gemara, which says you shouldn't drink a cup of curses, but the Rebbe seems to be making the association. That the, what, what the Pesach Mo'ovin means when he says to empty it out because you just recited the 10, curse, the 10 plagues is because now you turned your cup into a cup of curses. Right? Now, says the Rebbe further, See the Darche Moshe, which is a book by the Ramon. And this Darche Moshe is quoted in the Atar of Shulchan Aruch, which we read earlier. Asher Tezayin HaShvichis, the 16 sprinkles, or the 16 pourings, in Kineget Shechar Baruch correspond to the sword of God, 
Malach Alamun Amlakama, which is the angel responsible for vengeance. 16 equals the name of the angel that's responsible for vengeance. So here's another reason why this cup is a cup of cursed. Cursed cup. What does the Rebbe say? Now, this is my suggested reading of what the Rebbe is saying. And this is one of the words where I think it's different than the Shara Kailu. And again, perhaps in another time, we'll compare the Shara Kailu and the Rebbe. And the Rebbe, and I'll tell you why I come to this conclusion. But this is what I think the Rebbe means. To make us realize that all the above is incorrect. What does all the above incorrect mean? What does it mean when he says all the above is incorrect? That the whole notion of thinking the cup of curses is wrong. Not just that there is curses, but the curses is out, not in. As would be implied by the Shara Kailu. But all the above is not right. That's not the intention. Our intention has nothing to do with vengeance. To rid ourselves of all of that thinking that this is about God's vengeance. And we have to have a mind, says the Rebbe. This is what the Rebbe is telling us. That the catastrophe, the anger and the wrath, that's only in the wine that goes out of the cup into the broken cup. And that which remains in the cup, is wine that is joyous. Because if you don't have that in mind, then indeed your cup is cursed. Because what are you thinking about when you're sprinkling the wine? Plagues. You're th- what? Plagues. You're thinking plagues. Right. You're thinking plague, plague one, plague two, plague two. See, even if you're thinking God's vengeance, and all, but you're thinking plague. Mm. If that's the case, you turn your, wine, your cup into a wine of curse. And if it's a cup of curse, you should be making a bracha. And therefore, says al you have to be thinking that when I'm pouring the wine out, I am cleansing the wine of the curse. Because all the curse is going out. Mm-hmm. Using the power of Bina, I'm getting rid of the, the anger that's in, that's in Malchus. Restraining that's explaining what this, huh? Restraining it. I'm, I'm cleansing it. That's right. And by having that intention, now the cup that I have is indeed not a cursed cup. So refill it and keep on going. Which halakhti is the best also. Because halakhti speaking, you're supposed to, the halakha says, you're supposed to read the Haggadah on the second cup. Which I actually saw, that the, I actually saw a source which said the uh, Two different sources. One source that said, refuse to do this custom because the Mishnah says to read the Haggadah on the second cup. What are you pouring out wine for? You're supposed to read the Haggadah on the second cup and you're pouring out wine? So cancel the custom. Others I saw who bring a new cup of wine. Someone mentioned that before. Robert, you mentioned that. Or you mentioned that. Instead of pouring out from the cup of wine that you have in front of you, bring a new cup of wine and pour out from there. So you get the custom, but the cup of wine you have in front of you is still the Haggadah being read. But with the al custom, we have the best of both. This cup is reading the Haggadah including the curses on it. But what am I doing when I do the curses? I'm reading my cup of the curses. Unless my cup is now even more joyous, not less. You have to make a bracha after you. You're not drinking yet. You're drinking one later. Yeah, but you have to make a bracha later. Yeah, you make a bracha later when you drink the wine. Yeah, certainly. That you do anyway. That's certainly anyway. Because after we pour it, we go to more reading. Tayenu. And then we finally get to the bracha at the end where we, make the, where we drink the second cup of wine. We clear on this so far? Okay, so now let's get to the Rebbe's final comment, and I'll try to explain perhaps what this Kabbalistic meaning is. I haven't seen any like Sefer or Mimer which explains what this Kabbalistic meaning is, but I'll suggest perhaps something. So and it's based anybody, on the following comment. Is anybody sitting around the table using their finger? Don't do anything. Don't say anything, because they have what to rely on. <laughs> don't, 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 don't make a ruckus. It's, it's in the Shulchan Aruch. So. It's in the Shulchan Aruch. Don't make a ruckus. I was going to say that. I'm just showing you how perfect the Rebbe's Haggadah is, and how perfect the Rebbe's Haggadah is. Like, everything comes out perfect. Now let, let's see, find there was comment. So I, noted, I already noted to you earlier, there was comment was like this. The, 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 the text of the Alter Bethagada, which is almost verbatim, that Deva points out, is verbatim from a book called the Mishnah Chassidim. Not exactly verbatim, but almost verbatim. So the language there is like this. We'll go back up to page seven. What's the Kavana? The Kavana, you should have in mind. Shakois, you said the Malchus, the cup is Malchus. The Shoifik Mahayayin Shibesoichoi, you're pouring out the wine that's inside Malchus. So the Avazam, which that wine is anger and wrath. Shabbat, which was, which was in the cup. I'm getting rid of it. Through the power of Bina. So what is through the power of Bina? You could mistakenly read it, that the anger comes from the power of Bina. So it says the Rebbe in the comment on the top of page 12. You pour out using the power of Bina. So not that the anger is from the power of Bina, but you're pouring out from the power of Bina. So what's happening here? You have a cup, you have wine, you have Bina, and you have Bina pouring wine out of cup. So what are all these things? So perhaps it's something like this. Malchus, of course, we know, is 
uh, communication and projection. That's what Malchus represents. You know this, all those alone. Sumus Lotus, Malchus is the final sphere which communicates. And we know Malchus is referred to all over as a cup, as kois, because a cup doesn't have any content of its own. Its job is to receive content from somewhere and deliver it somewhere else, just like the power to communicate. The, cap, the power to communicate doesn't have any content. It accumulates content from my inner faculties, from my ideas, from my emotions. They are put into the power of my communication, the cup, and then communicated out. Now, I got all kinds of content inside of me. I got good content and I got anger content. And it's all gonna come out through malchus. I can't like hide some part of my emotional makeup. I can't hide the wine. The wine's in the cup. The wine being the content that's in the cup, right? It's the, it's the feelings that are being put into the communication. And included in there is anger. So what, what do I do? I wanna be fully happy. I wanna get myself with anger. Anger stops me from being happy, not just somebody else. Anger stops me from being happy. So if I want yain and sameach, I want wine that's truly joyous, I have to get rid of the anger. I have to put it into the, but, but, but if I get it out, it, it could do a lot of damage. So where do you put your anger? You have to redirect it. If you want to leave the content of your neshama, the content of your cup, the content of your malchus, to be yain and sameach, wine that's joyous, you have to get rid of the, the anger. You have to get rid of the wrath. Which means that you expel it. You have to find a proper recipient for your anger. Where's the proper recipient for your anger? Klipa, a broken vessel. That which is disconnected from God. That should be your anger. You should get annoyed and perturbed at the notion of this detachment from Hashem. So any anger you have inside of you, redirect it to that which is against and opposing Hashem. You're not denying your emotion. You're redirecting it to a certain right place. And once you redirect your anger to the right place, now you can be left with all the joy that you have. By what power do you do that? By what power do you redirect anger to the right place? You said before, Bina. Bina, through a little bit of mind. If you leave it to the emotion, the emotions just run wild. You want the emotion to decide where it should be expressed? Yeah. It's going to be expressed in the worst possible place. The, yeah. first, the first possible place that comes to you to allow you to express emotion, it's going to come splurting out. But you have to have Bina. If you have Koyach Bina, the power of Bina, then you can use the cognizance to say, okay, there's all kinds of emotions, and they're all healthy, and they're all good, if directed in the right way. So Bina comes and says, okay, anger, you have your place. Klippa. And once you can eject your anger onto Klippa, now the content of your soul, the content of your cup, is full of joy. And that's the kavana, this seems to me, is the kavana that's happening here in this pouring. Which is why the whole thing is one blessing. No part of it is curse. Everything is positive. And the pouring out is just a cleansing process to rid myself of that anger, not rid myself by somehow denying it, but by finding the right recipient for the anger, which is the no klippa, which is this, a distance and detachment from Hashem. Put your wrath there. You're feeling perturbed in life? Good. Find the areas in life where you're detached from Hashem and get annoyed at those. <laughs> and then the rest of your experience is joy and gladness and happiness. And then you can refill the cup. Uh, no longer with uh, uh, anger free. So, of course, there, there are more comments, more stuff, but this is uh, overall history, various different customs, and we're the context of how the, per the perfect Chabad custom emerges based on Al Rebbe and Rebbe's comments. Amen. Wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.